Episode 93, Exploring the Surface of Titan. Hello and welcome to AstroTalk UK. ATUK is a not-for-profit podcast produced by me, Gurbir Singh, amateur astronomer and writer based in the UK. I produce this podcast for my own education and share it as a free educational resource with anyone who has an interest. ATUK has no subscribers, ads, and you do not need to log in. For more information, please see the About page at www.astrotalkuk.org. In the early hours of Christmas Day 2004, a small probe called Huygens separated from the larger spacecraft Cassini. Three weeks later, on 14th of January, it descended through Titan's atmosphere to make the most distant soft landing in the solar system to date. Huygens transmitted data during its 136 minute descent and a further 130 minute from the surface until Cassini disappeared below the horizon. Professor John Zarnecki was the principal investigator for the UK-based team that built the instruments that first made contact on the surface of Titan, Saturn and the solar system's largest moon. In this conversation, recorded in December 2020, Professor Zarnecki recalls how the mission came about, the science Huygens revealed at the time, and today, a decade and a half later. Cassini-Huygens was a joint mission between NASA and ESA. He also shares his views on the value of international collaboration in space. Well, Cassini-Huygens was a collaborative project between ESA, the European Space Agency, and NASA. Um, it, the two agencies collaborate increasingly frequently. Um, it's sometimes difficult because they have different timetables, different schedules, different funding cycles, and so on. But because of really, in this case, uh, three people from the scientific community, they pressurized the agencies to mount this incredibly ambitious mission. And I, I should mention those three people, a Chinese scientist called Wing Ip, who was working in Germany at the time, Daniel Gauthier from France, and Toby Owen from the USA, three excellent scientists who, uh, as I say, really made it happen. And it was a collaboration then between ESA, the European Space Agency, and the US agency, NASA, uh, with ESA providing the Huygens probe dedicated to study Titan, Saturn's largest moon. And the Huygens probe essentially rode piggyback on the larger Cassini spacecraft, which was provided by NASA. And this was selected in, I think it was 1990. We actually arrived in the Saturnian system in July 2004. Um, mm. And then the separation of Huygens from Cassini, that happened on the third orbit in December 2004. That's what you're thinking of. In fact, n nature played a bit of a trick. And it turned out that the time of separation of Huygens from Cassini was, would you believe it, December the 25th, 2004, yeah. Christmas Day. Um, NASA hated that because, uh, you know, for a critical maneuver like that, you had to have lots of uh, people monitoring at the ground stations, at the large deep space network dishes. And I guess they all had to be paid, you know, time and a half because it was Christmas Day. <laughs> And so it was one of the strangest Christmas days I had, um, but it was a it was a great success. And um, I seem to remember Christmas lunch was late that day, but uh, it was well worth the wait because, yeah, Poygan separated, 
And from the instant it was separated, there was absolutely nothing we could do. It was then on a ballistic trajectory that took it inexorably to, it was on a collision course with Titan. We couldn't command it. We could only receive data from it. I mean, it was remarkable. From that point, everything was autonomous. It was, you know, it was a sophisticated robot that took all the decisions itself. Huygens was designed to carry a payload of six scientific instruments. Of course, we'd have liked to have had a lot more, but, you know, you're limited by the onboard resources, mass, power, data, and so on. So six instruments, um, I suppose the largest with a camera and uh, a chemical analyzer. And I was selected to provide something called the surface, the surface science package. And as the name implies, we were trying to measure the properties of the surface of Titan. Now, you have to realize that at this time, we had no idea what the surface was going to be like. We didn't even know if it was a solid or possibly a liquid surface. And survival of the probe on the surface was far from guaranteed. In fact, it was regarded as a sort of added bonus. So most of the measurements, maybe all the measurements, would be taken during the nominal two and a half hour descent. But it was thought that, hey, this probe might survive for a few minutes on the surface. So let's have an instrument dedicated to taking measurements on that surface. So that's what my team um, was aiming to do. And we had a little package of nine different sensors, which between them we hope would give us a clue as to what was going on on the surface. At this point, um, Titan is known for its uh, cloud-covered, globally cloud-covered um, atmosphere. So you could not know uh, where on Titan you were going to land, let alone what kind of, uh, was it going to be a liquid surface, a desert, or mount, top of a mountain, or maybe on, <laughs> end up perched on a, uh, a cliff edge or something. Did you have any idea uh, of, um, well, presumably you had some idea of where on the surface geographically it was going to be uh, landing, but could you have any idea of the kind of nature of the surface it was going to be uh, landing on and therefore prepare for that kind of landing? Right. We knew where we were going to land, at least approximately geographically, about uh, from memory, uh, latitude of 20 degrees, 20 degrees north of the equator. But we essentially had no idea of what it would be like. The models at the time, the models based on data primarily from uh, Voyager 1 and 2, which had flown past uh, around 1980, 1981. So one possibility was that Titan was essentially a, a ball of ice. So we'd land on a hard, icy surface. At the other extreme, there was this, in, there was indirect evidence that Titan might even have had a global sea, not of liquid water, far too cold for that, minus 180 degrees centigrade, but liquid hydrocarbon uh, such as methane and ethane. So, so a sea of, of LPG, liquefied petroleum gas. Um, or something in the middle, um, one of the reasons for the great interest in Titan was the photochemistry that was expected and, and kind of observed to be going on in the thick atmosphere. And a product of that chemistry, which would rain out on the surface, perhaps, would be, to use a technical term, goo or gunge, sort of a bit like tar or heavy oil. So it, it, we could either have a hard hit on the surface, we could splash down, or we could kind of splosh down into a gungy, tarry uh, surface. So it, it could have been any of those. Uh, we, we had no idea. I mean, that was one of the reasons for having a dedicated probe. Did you in any way, uh, or rather, how could you prepare a vehicle to land on 
uh, surface with such unknown variation, as you say, from very hard uh, rock-like surface to a splashdown or something in between. What uh, could the, how do you go about trying to design something like, uh, like that with so many unknowns? Well, the truth is we didn't. This is why, because of this incredible uncertainty uh, concerning the surface, Huygens was designed essentially as an atmospheric probe. In fact, I used to get into trouble, terrible trouble from ESA if I called it a lander, because they, of course, had contracts with the aerospace companies who were building the probe. And they couldn't really put a contract on them that ensured that the probe would survive in this unknown environment. I mean, it would have added probably millions of euros to the, to the cost. So survival on the surface was always, I think technically they described it as a goal. So it was uh, would be nice to have, if you know what I mean. Um, and the critical measurements were designed to be done during the descent. Now, we, from an engineering perspective, the whole mission was aimed at three minutes on the surface. That was regarded as the best we could get. So our instruments were designed for three minutes. In fact, we thought, well, well, of course, we might have got zero. We could have been destroyed on impact or it could have been just a few seconds. So in fact, we designed the instrument to make what we thought would be the critical measurements within fractions of a second. And then we would package the data immediately and, and package the most critical data to send it back, you know, instantly without any processing. And then if we survived longer, we would um, send the, the full data set, but gradually send it. Uh, and, and then, you know, if we survived, gosh, three minutes, that would have been, you know, heaven. We, we could send the full data set. And what happened, we survived for 72 minutes on the surface, which, which we never envisaged. Um, and in fact, if I have any regrets, one of them is that we didn't imagine that we could have survived so long. We'd have made the instruments a little bit more flexible. We'd have done, uh, put in more capability to them. And in fact, the camera, which was not part of my instrument, uh, the camera took 72 minutes of images of the same scene. There was... <laughs> no ability to scan around to pan um right. and uh you know we would joke afterwards that there were probably a bunch of penguins uh sitting on the <laughs> other side of the probe making faces at us um but we we, we just didn't know because uh as i say we we just couldn't imagine it, it was so challenging so difficult we thought that uh, the survival for, for seconds or a few minutes was the best we could expect. I mean, it, it's fascinating that you have to deal with contingencies for so many of the variety of so many different scenarios. And of course, I remember when Apollo 11 uh, landed, one of the tasks that uh, Neil Armstrong had was to pick up some a rock and store it away. It's one of his first things to do, just in case they had to leave uh, rather urgently and quickly. Absolutely. Um, That's okay. It... okay, so if I take you back then, uh, on the 25th of December uh, 2004, the Huygens probe separates from the mothership Cassini, which is going to remain in uh, orbit around Saturn. It starts its journey, as you said, uh, completely autonomously on its way to uh, the surface of, uh, of Titan. Majority of the data that you're going to collect the, is going to be collected during the descent. So if you just take us through, um, once the Huygens has left Cassini, first of all, is the data transmission from Huygens directly to Earth or via uh, Cassini uh, as it's orbiting Saturn? 
So the data transmission from Huygens to the Earth was via Cassini. We just didn't have enough power on board or a large enough dish to be able to transmit directly to the Earth. So from, from the very beginning of the design of the mission, Cassini was planned to be the relay. And um, so during the descent, Cassini had to point its antenna, its four meter dish, at where it thought Huygens was. Now, luckily, it had a fairly broad beam of, of you know, acceptance of data. Um, but that was always a, a, a worry in the most extreme case. If the winds were very different from what we thought, it was possible that Huygens would have been blown out of the field of vision, if you like, of Cassini. So Cassini just looked and stared at where it thought Huygens was and just sucked up anything that was transmitted to it. It, in fact, stared for over four hours, even though in reality, it, it, the mission, the Huygens mission would have been shorter than that. And once it had done that, it immediately turned towards Earth to send the, the Huygens data back to Earth. It was regarded as so critical, you didn't want to run the risk that something would happen to Cassini. So that was done, um, or at least it was done as soon as it was possible, as soon as Cassini was in sight of the large issues on, on Earth. And of course, the data on Cassini sure. was recorded redundantly, was recorded on two memories for redundancy. So as Huygens is approaching the uh, atmosphere, the upper atmosphere of uh, Titan, I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of aero braking and then the uh, descent through the atmosphere using parachutes. So just tell, take us through that journey of Huygens through the atmosphere of Titan. So the, the, journey, the journey from release by Cassini is nominally a gentle one. Huygens is spinning slowly for stability. I think it's seven revs per minute, something like that. And the first sign that something is interesting is happening is when Huygens touches the very top of Titan's atmosphere. Now, Titan's atmosphere is incredibly thick. And in fact, one of our instruments would have been pretty much the first to get any data. We had an incredibly sensitive accelerometer. And the purpose of that was to literally measure the deceleration of the probe uh, as a result of friction with the atmosphere. And that is really the most sensitive way to measure the density profile of the atmosphere. We got our first measurement at around 1,550 kilometers above the surface of Titan. And that accelerometer worked, in fact, far better than we expected. In fact, I it should, yes, I'll tell you this. We, even to this day, we don't quite understand why it worked so well. Um, in, in some ways, the space environment is, is, is actually quite nice and, you know, noise free. And that's mm. probably why it worked so well. So um, then over the next two minutes, the probe experienced enormous deceleration as it plowed into this thick atmosphere. And that's where the front heat shield came into play. It, it had two functions. One is to decelerate, to slow it down from the speed of around seven kilometers per second. So it's really moving. Um, mm -hmm. But the other thing that it has to do, this slowing down generates enormous heat so this heat shield, it, it, it's like, you know, probes which um, re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, only more extreme. Hmm. So it has to dissipate enormous amount of heat and, and it ablates, you know, material is burnt off and, and uh, blows away. So that takes about two minutes. 
And then, and this is all controlled automatically, at a certain point, just around the point of maximum deceleration, the first parachute is deployed, uh, pilot parachute. Um, and then that's at about a height of, it turned out about 150 kilometers above the surface, 180, something like that. And then basically, mm -hmm. it's a, a question of drifting down under a series of three parachutes, which gave us two hours and 27 minutes. Once the probe has left Cassini, uh, Huygens can only communicate via Cassini and Cassini is orbiting Saturn. So it's a very dynamic environment where both spacecraft are moving. Yes. Were you able to get that uh, measurement of the very first encounter of Huygens with the uh, atmosphere of Titan at that altitude of, altitude of 15,500, 1,500 uh, meters, kilometers, Kilo. thank you, pardon, in real time? Or did you have to wait for Cassini to, to complete a, uh, uh, an orbit or something? That, that's a very good question. In, in fact, the whole series of events was quite surreal in, in one respect, because there we all were at the European Space Operations Centre in, in Darmstadt in Germany, knowing that whatever was going to happen was actually happening now, if you like, in, in the morning mm -hmm. on Friday, and, and we knew nothing about it. And in, in fact, because of the series of operations, Cassini pointing its dish at Huygens, and then only later turning to send the data back to Earth. And it took about 90 minutes for the signal to travel from Cassini to Earth, just at the speed of light. Um, so we were expecting to find out what was happening something like four or five hours after it had all happened. So that was a very strange feeling. Um, in fact, we did get some advanced warning and this this is i think a fascinating story uh, we we'd always asked isa was there any chance of picking up any data directly from huygens at, at the earth and it was always mm -hmm. said and this was certainly the case when the mission was designed that the technology was totally beyond uh, achieving that there just there was no way that would work but as you know, technology doesn't stand still. So 15 years after the design, or, or let's say 12 years, we were still pushing ESA and they said, well, you know, technology has moved on. And especially the big move forward was in the low noise amplifiers and, and you know, at, at large uh, dishes, large receivers on the earth. So I think around 2002, ESA put out a little study contract to people who knew about this and they came back and said with the latest receivers at the world's largest dishes it might be possible to pick up something from Huygens directly so um, mm -hmm. we got the Parks dish in Australia and Green Bank in West Virginia two of the largest dishes in the world to try to listen to Huygens. Now, and, and they succeeded. They didn't pick up the data, but they picked up the carrier signal. So if you like the background hum, it was right on the limit of detectability. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it was Green Bank at the time when Huygens, we knew should be descending through the atmosphere they picked up the carrier. And the fact that they were picking it up meant that Huygens hadn't burnt up, wasn't in a thousand pieces. It was transmitted. We didn't know what it was transmitting, but it was transmitted. And that was fabulous news. So, and that was a bonus. We didn't expect that. So we knew that- and that's coming to- it, As it turned out, mm -hmm. that signal, the, um, the carrier, um, we got, in fact, lots of science out of that because by looking at the Doppler shift of that mm -hmm. signal, 
you could reconstruct that in terms of the motion of Huygens. And you could see it, you could work out its speed, and you could see that changing during the descent. You could see it being blown by the wind. You could see the wind changing speed and changing direction. And then you could see it sitting on the surface. You know, the, obviously the speed mm -hmm. changed suddenly right. at the yeah. point of impact. Now, this, was, this took a lot of processing to get that information. Mm -hmm. But it was it was a, a you know an extra piece of science. So and that, that's science just from the carrier wave. There's no Correct. data in there. It's just pure signal. And if I can just take you further along the same thought, and I think this kind these kinds of experiments have been done uh, on other planetary missions. So when Huygens is on the surface and is transmitting data to Cassini, that data transmission. Now, it's not just a carrier, but it's actually carrier plus the data. Does that itself tell you something about the atmosphere through which that signal is transmitting? That's a very good question, and I'm not sure that I can answer it. I mean, <coughs> the, the main data on the atmosphere came from the direct in situ measurements. Um, so for example, the chemical composition from the mass spectrometer. Hmm. You know, literally, Huygens was sniffing the gas and analysing it. And mm -hmm. our instruments and those from a colleague measured the physical structure, the pressure, the temperature and the density as we descended. There's some information, I think, from the radio signal, um, from the, the, the absorption and the change of polarization. But the major data on the composition and the structure of the atmosphere came from Huygens itself being embedded in that atmosphere. So apart from that uh, cliff edge of knowing that uh, Huygens was fine, uh, it's descended through the atmosphere of Titan. It's got its camera running, so you have these visuals of it descending, and it eventually does land. And uh, uh, if you can tell us now what kind of um, surface did it land on, how would you describe it, and what kind of um, uh, what did the surface look like, and if this is possible, how did it compare with what you thought it might look like? Once we picked up the signals from Cassini, but ultimately from Huygens, and I should just tell you, tell you that was a cliffhanger because the signal from Huygens was, came later than we thought, um, by, by you know, minutes, tens of minutes even. So there was a bit of a cliff edge there. It was very nerve-wracking. But the point came at which suddenly we saw real data from Huygens. So though this was four or five hours after the event, maybe even longer, it was as if we were watching the whole thing happen in real time. So we were sitting in the control room in Germany watching the data streams coming in. And of course, data streams, these are just a, a series of numbers. Um, and we weren't getting the real time images. They needed some processing. But my team was sitting looking at the data. And some of it was relatively easy to process. We could see the probe moving slightly, swinging, for example, as it descended. And I can remember as time went on, we were realizing we were getting closer and closer to the surface and data was still pouring in. I mean, we were absolutely over the moon, literally, um, with this data pouring in. We didn't know what it all meant in real time. And then suddenly, I can't remember which sensor it was, but one of them, probably one of the, the accelerometers, one of the accelerometers, one of my colleagues was monitoring it and it suddenly went mm -hmm. to zero. You know, so we'd hit the surface, and I remember he shouted out, "We're on the surface!" And everyone was <laughs> shouting and screaming, and the data was still coming in. 
you know, we'd landed, but there was still data there. It was, it was absolutely mm -hmm. remarkable. And the guys who understood these sensors, they said, yeah, the, the data looks, looks good. I think, I think the sensors are working. And then it was, it took the camera team about an hour or two to process. They had to clean up the images and, and so on and do a bit of processing because everything had to be very compressed because we had very limited data. And I can remember it was a, it's a, the press were there and they came into the operations room with the first image. In fact, I think they came in with the landing image. So we saw the mm -hmm. view looking out across the surface of Titan with little pebbles and an undulating surface with a strong orange tinge because of light scattered by the thick clouds on Titan. And, well, it was just, just stunning. Um, it's very hard to put into words the emotions when you realize that you're, you know, your beloved instruments on that <laughs> lovely probe, which was, you know, like our, our, our own baby, if you like, was sitting in this environment. Yeah. One of the uh, uh, bits that I remember from the visuals, from the pictures, from the camera, was the shadow of the parachute. As it's after, immediately after landing, the parachute descends and you can see the shadow of the parachute. The shadow, uh, ab I, absolutely incredible, yes. And it was purely by chance that I'm guessing that uh, the camera was facing the direction where the shadow of the parachute would fall. Indeed, it would be nice to say that that was all designed, but <laughs> that was a, a, a little piece of luck. But and as I said, okay. the camera then produced 72 minutes of essentially the same image. <laughs> In fact, the instruments and the Huygens probe worked for longer on the surface. The reason that we lost any more data was that literally Cassini disappeared over the horizon. So Cassini was flying overhead, mm -hmm. I think, you know, 50,000 kilometers to act as the relay. And, and of mm -hmm. course, it gradually disappeared over the horizon. So we believe from the telemetry, from the housekeeping data, that we had about 10 to 20 more minutes of power in the batteries. So, so th th there's a bit of data mm. floating around the, the, the universe from, from Huygens <laughs> that was transmitted, <laughs> but uh, Cassini didn't get it. So somebody out there might be getting some, some strange signals from, from Huygens. And it was just when the penguins came around to the other side as, as well, I'm sure. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. So the um, time limit uh, for Huygens to transmit was limited by the battery, but also when Cassini was overhead over Titan. And of course, it was quite a complex uh, orbit that would bring Cassini back over to Titan, but that would be weeks and months later before. That's by right. That time, Cassini the would reappeared over Titan. I think then the orbit was something like. 40 days so by that time the batteries would have been dead even though the thermal um, design it worked very well because remember the time is minus 180 degrees um, the, 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 we hardly saw any drop in temperature but by then 40 days later um, Huygens would have been frozen the electronics would have stopped working so I would love to see it one day i you know regard it as a, a a heritage site you know it's a piece of human um archaeology and uh one one day probably not in my lifetime uh it'll be found and uh, it'll actually be an interesting bit of science i think the the coatings and coverings on it from the chemistry in titan's atmosphere will actually be quite instructive. I'm sure there'll be a couple of scientific papers to be got just from that. Well, you know, I think it was the uh, um, scientist Carl Sagan who said that um, there's only gonna be one generation which explores the, uni the solar system for the first time. And I think the work that you and your team did uh, on the 
surface of Titan was that very first time. And it's something so unique. And uh, thank you very much for sharing that particular episode. Now, it's been about a decade and a half since um, that particular uh, instance of the landing. But of course, Cassini was in orbit over Saturn for a long time, and it took many additional images from orbit of, uh, of Titan. What, do we, what have we learned from these science, not just from Huygens, but from Cassini about the surface of Titan? Let me say a little bit about Huygens and Cassini. Huygens essentially made measurements over an area on the surface of Titan of at most 100 square kilometers. When it came through the clouds and started to see with the camera uh, the surface, that was an area of about 100 square kilometers. Uh, and in fact, my instrument, the penetrometer, which, which pushed into the surface of Titan and kind of told us something about its physical makeup, measured one square centimeter, uh, maybe two squares. <laughs> now, you've got to remember, the surface of Titan is about 80 million square kilometers. So, so uh, we, 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 that, that, that's sampling, isn't it? You know, um, Cassini had about 120 or so flybys of Titan in its 13-year life. And so it made measurements of eventually of much of the surface of Titan. So we've got this contrast between Huygens giving us sort of details of a limited area and Cassini having wider coverage, but of course not the resolution. It had several instruments which were able to peer through the clouds to a greater or lesser extent, the visible camera, and which had some windows in the near infrared where it could sort of see the surface. And the radar probably gave us the best coverage of the surface, um, but with resolution of kilometers, several kilometers at best. So what did those tell us? Well, the first thing is that though Huygens landed in what we think is a dried up lake, there was no direct evidence of large bodies of standing liquid where we were, though we think the surface was damp, there was no, the liquid wasn't standing on the surface. Cassini found, particularly in the polar regions, uh, large lakes and even seas of, of liquid methane and ethane on the surface. So the largest is just larger than the largest inland seas on, on Earth. I think the area is about 400,000 square kilometers, which is bigger than the largest of the Great Lakes or the Caspian Sea. So these are really substantial bodies of liquid. So it found, and I think those covered in the polar regions, about 10% of the surface. And it saw rivers feeding uh, some of these lakes. Um, in the equatorial regions, these looked much drier. There were indications of not mountains, but certainly hills. Maybe the largest um, elevation was, was hundreds of meters, maybe a kilometer. And one feature which seems quite common, the, the best word I can use or, or expression is dune fields. So dunes like in the, the Sahara Desert, for example, so undulating periodic structures of what we're not sure, um, and not sand as in deserts on earth, but pro probably particles of dried up organic material Perhaps the stuff which rains out of the atmosphere then dries on the surface and is blown by the light wind into these dune-like features. Those seem fairly common, um, certainly in the equatorial regions. Um, and then also just a few impact craters, probably you know, no more than, than a dozen at very most. Remember, with a thick atmosphere... Uh, and, and, and probably active um, 
geology to an extent, um, these would either, the atmosphere would cause um, meteoroids to burn up and with the surface being active, any craters that are produced would generally over the you know, thousands, millions of years would have been obliterated as, as happens on Earth. But there were certainly a few seen and perhaps most tantalizingly, some evidence maybe of what we call cryovolcanoes, so low temperature mm. volcanism. And was there much evidence of water? There were a lot of, you mentioned hills and, and, and mountains. What kind of material would they be made of? Uh, well, we know Titan is probably 60% ice, icy material, 40% rocky. So we, we, would, we believe that the rocky material formed the core. So there's a, there's a, 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 a rocky, maybe molten, partially molten core. So the ice, what we see will be an icy uh, surface and mantle. Um, what no, sort we are of talking ice? about well, water ice. Well, yes, but not pure. It, 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 no. it, it, we have indications from the reflect the spectrum that is reflected off the mm -hmm. surface that it's let's call it dirty water ice. But the, what what is mm -hmm. the contamination? We're not sure. You know, ammonia, carbon dioxide, all sorts of things probably. But it's an icy light material um, and uh, but that will also be contaminated by all the stuff that's raining down from the atmosphere and that's one of the many reasons to go back uh, now to really study in great detail the composition um, but of course there is also what we have also seen from Cassini we have seen meteorology weather now, you've got to remember that Titan, the Saturnian system, is about 10 times further away from the sun than we are. That means sunlight, and it's the sun which drives weather here on Earth and on Titan. Sunlight is one hundredth, one over 10 squared, one hundredth of what it is here at Earth. Mm. So there's much less energy to drive weather. But some of the images show clouds. They show clouds moving. So a little storm system moving across the surface. And that is probably um, giving us rain. Not rain of water, yeah. but methane. Methane and ethane rain. That is mm. falling on the hills, feeding the rivers, which are seen, which then flows into the lakes and seas. So the fascinating thing is that we see, just like we have on Earth a water cycle, on Titan we have a methane cycle. And would you believe that as Earth, the conditions on the surface of the Earth, are we are near what is called the triple point of water, which means on Earth, water can exist as a solid, a liquid or a gas, Mm -hmm. On Titan, exactly the same happens with methane. Methane is near the triple point, at the surface, triple point of methane. So, really, methane is playing the role on Titan that water does here on Earth. So, what a laboratory for doing meteorology with different materials and different physical conditions. But physics, we believe, is the same anywhere in the universe including Titan. Some exciting possibilities there for astrobiology. I'll leave that for a, another time. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, well, first of all, I, I just share with you, I remember when I was a teenager looking and uh, reading a lot of sci-fi and looking at these um, artists who would portray as sort of outer world scenes. And I think one of the contributions that uh, your mission has done is actually realized for me in practical terms of having gone there and taken some images of these alien, I call them alien worlds, and it's no longer 
science fiction, but fiction. That if we think forward just, I think, 15 years, we have the possibility that when the Dragonfly mission deploys on the surface of Titan, we're going to have essentially a drone flying around 500 meters, kilometer above the surface of Titan with, of course, an onboard camera. So we are going to be flying around over the surface of this alien world. And, and you know, gradually it will feel a lot less alien as we, we, you know, we can fly around ourselves over this surface. Dragonfly mission to Titan, which has been selected by NASA and is currently under construction, it's led by a, a husband and wife team. The leader is uh, Elizabeth Turtle. Uh, she's, I think, the principal investigator, and the chief scientist is her husband, uh, Ralph Lorenz. Now, Ralph was my PhD student uh, at the University of Kent when we started the Sini Huygens way back around 1990. So I feel connected uh, through, through the two of them. They were both with me at the launch of uh, Cassini Huygens back in 1997. Gosh, if you told us then that not only would we land on, on, on Titan, but uh, within their lives, they would be leading a return to Titan with a drone, technically, I think it's called a, a quadcopter. Um, gosh, we, <laughs> we would not have believed that. The adventure continues. Okay, if I can now change uh, topics a little bit. Um, Christine Huygens was uh, a collaboration, as you've already said, between NASA and the European Space Agency. Um, you've spoken at length uh, before about uh, international cooperation in space in particular. Given um, the geopolitics of the world and they're always continuing, they're always shifting, how important a role do you think space, in particular the European Space Agency, plays in bringing countries together? Well, you know, I'm, a, I'm an ageing hippie. I'm a product of the 1960s. So I still have in me, despite all the terrible things that, that happen, I still have this idealism. Um, I still believe in peace and love, man, and think we can... You know, live in harmony peacefully, and 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 space is one of those environments where it 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 does happen. Um, I think I'm not being, you know, overly idealistic and op optimistic here. I mean, ESA is is a great example. When I think this mission started, I think uh, I, I remember on the slides that I used to show there were 16 flags along the bottom. Uh, I think ESA is now 22 member states. And for most of us who work in, in space in Europe, it, it's, we, we don't think twice about it. I mean, it, it's, it's always like this. You know, you might be working on, a, on a, a spacecraft where the software comes from Finland. The, um, the heat shield comes from Sicily. The... Um, onboard uh, data handling is from Poland and you know and you just mix with the scientists and engineers speaking English French or a mixture of all sorts of languages it's just it's the way way we work and and ESA I think also partly because of its position and and geopolitics it's able to work and collaborate with most spacefaring nations of the world and, and, and does on the whole successfully. I mean, there are issues and challenges. Um, at the working level, it, it, I have to say, on the whole, it works remarkably well. And to me, it's one of the great pleasures. I mean, it's not just the quest for knowledge, the quest for science, the discovery, the exploration, but the fact that there, you know, there are environments in which we can work across boundaries seamlessly it's not about making money 
it's really just the thirst for knowledge. And uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry if I sound a bit lyrical about it, but you know, it does generally work. And I have to say that on the whole, though, you know, scientists and engineers are not perfect. They have their idiosyncrasies, they're human beings with all their faults. But on the whole, we are very collaborative. We, you know, our raison d'etre is to find out. And when we find out, we want everybody to know. So I have to say that is one of the great pleasures of working on projects such as this. Do you think, apart from the fact that collaboration is essential to make big projects possible, without that collaboration, it just wouldn't happen. But also, um, I tend to believe that we as a society, as a, indeed as a civilization, um, historically, particularly just looking at European history, you know, there have been wars between all the nations for a long time. Uh, do you think I'm pushing it by suggesting that the collaboration that we take, that takes place in space and in other fields, does help to avoid um, conflict here, in, here on Earth? I like to think that that is true. You know, maybe I am an idealist, but I mean, at one level, I think trust is developed just by seeing other people, you know, seeing people from across the border. And, and you see, um, basically, that, that we look the same, or even if we don't look exactly the same, once we start working together, you know, differences are, are, are disappear. Um, and, uh, and then also there's perhaps more, more practically, we become interdependent. You know, we depend on each other to some extent, uh, technically. Um, we develop, you know, different countries develop different specialities. So we need each other. You need the, you know, the expertise from Spain, that particular expertise from Russia or from China or wherever. So, uh, you know, there's the, the kind of more idealistic aspect of it or the practical aspect. You know, and we see this in, in, in so many areas now with the business of complex supply chain with with different countries providing different inputs. We, you know, the reality is that we all need each other more, probably, in this complicated world. But you see the rise of um, United Arab, Arab Emirates, mission to Mars. The many countries in the African Union now have some aspect of a, a space program. Um, this internationalization uh, is a big change for the space community and also through SpaceX and um, many, uh, many uh, private sector companies around the world, in India and in China and elsewhere, there's a rise of the private space sector. How do you think those two big changes, more countries and more companies involved in space, how will that change the space exploration landscape, do you think, in the coming decade or so? When I started as a fr fresh-faced young research student, there were very few players in space. I mean, it, it was really the Soviet Union and the USA with, you know, Europe as, as a bit player. Um, so that has evolved enormously, as you say. And it, I think it's fascinating. Quite what it means, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's... It, 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 I find it exciting, you know, the fact that India, China, Japan, in addition to the more traditional players now are, are going to the moon and Mars and the UAE, as you mentioned, um, it, it's making it more, can I say more democratic? I'm not sure if that's the right word. Certainly mm -hmm. more, more, yeah. more players. I think it's great for the citizens of, of the world. Uh, there are more and more who feel an involvement. Um, it, you know, though the Americans landed on the moon for all mankind, or 
all humanity. And I think there was an element of that. It is nice to see, you know, somebody you can identify with very closely involved. So I think that's positive. And also, I think that done correctly, you can see space technology, space science as a tool for development. It can, if done appropriately, really help to drive the development of educational levels, technical, technological levels. And there's certain, you know, in some countries, I think South Africa is a good example where they have their own space agency and it is seen as a, as, as a part of the armory of development. Um, I think it's got to be done in the right way. And it's, it's challenging, you know, because a lot of this is not cheap. Um, it, it, brings, it brings new challenges, of course, because to some extent, space needs to be policed and regulated, you know, so there's not a complete free for all. You know, there's the issue of space debris, of course, where, you know, if you don't behave responsibly in space, you can mess it up for everybody else. But, uh, you know, I think most people behave responsibly in that respect. And um, the rise of, of private space is, is interesting. Now, I'm very much a product of the sort of the first um, generations of space development. So it was quite hard for me to see how this would pan out. And, you know, I saw it as very much the... Mm, it would be the, the big national and governmental agencies who would be the only people who could really lead the way. But I think, you know, recent years have shown that that is not correct. And what SpaceX have done is quite remarkable. Um, I'm not sure that they can do it all. I don't think they can do it all. You know, the, the sort of exploration that I've been involved with, the, the the Cassini-Huygens, the Giotto to Comet Halley, the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, this is never going to be done uh, by privateers. It, it is, it's fundamentally, it, it, these have to be government-led, national-led um, activities and projects. They are, they're driven by pure... Um, they're driven by the, the desire to know, to explore. There isn't an immediate financial return. So whereas I think that uh, private space can do an enormous amount in driving the technology, making it happen faster. So, you know, SpaceX is, is essentially funded by, by the US government and by NASA. That's, what, that's why they do it. And they probably do it quicker than if it was left to the rather cumbersome uh, government agency. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be a, a, a marriage between the two. Um, having said that, you know, looking ahead, maybe when we can prospect minerals from asteroids, then there'll be a role for the privateer. Um, as I suppose there was, you know, thinking back to the Californian gold rush and, and things like that. Um, the same will happen in space. But uh, yeah, it's an exciting time, that's for sure. Uh, finish with this thought. You were a professor at the Open University, which is um, centered in Milton Keynes. <clears throat> so there's uh, some scientific instruments which started their journey for Milton Keynes which are today on the surface of an alien planet, one and a half billion kilometers away. And I know there are many other people involved, but um, I just want to th uh, thank you for uh, taking us on that journey of exploration. It's been very uh, satisfying and not something I ever thought I would actually get to see in my lifetime. Really appreciate your time. Well, th well thank you. Um, you know, I am privileged to be of the generation who, as you reminded me earlier, that we are of the generation, a unique generation that can be, that have been the first to make these discoveries in our solar system. So I, I feel so privileged.